In this video, we'll talk about spectral line profiles. So suppose we have an atom with an electron in a higher energy state, which spontaneously decays down to a lower energy state, and releases a photon with an energy E is equal to H nu. Now you might expect, if you know that the upper electronic state, which we'll call E1, the energy of that state minus the energy of the lower state, E0, would always equal H nu. And the truth is, on average, it is equal. However, if I were to graph the number of photons that I get coming out of an atom undergoing this kind of a transition, I'll see that there's actually a spread in the distribution of photon energies I get. And the center of that distribution at nu zero will correspond to this energy difference here. So delta E will be equal to H nu zero. But for any particular atom that I have, undergoing this transition, there's a probability I'll get a photon at a lower energy, and there's a probability I'll get a photon at a higher energy, corresponding to a slightly lower or slightly higher frequency. And the function that describes the probability I get a photon as a function of frequency around the center frequency of this transition is called the line profile function. It's often denoted as phi being a function of frequency. So what we're going to talk about today are the different mechanisms that give rise to this line profile function, phi. So there are basically three different reasons why photons arising from a transition in an atom will show up at a frequency other than this average center frequency that corresponds to the energy of the transition. And these are natural line broadening, which is to say the intrinsic width of that line. There is Doppler broadening, which is caused by the motion of these atoms relative to the frame of the observer. And the final mechanism is collisional broadening. So even though it's the hardest to understand, let's start with natural broadening. Suppose I had a whole collection of these atoms here, and I put them all into an excited state, and then I sit and wait and measure how many photons come off of this as a function of time. Now, ignoring any effects of stimulated emission or anything, we're just talking about the decay probability of an electron in the excited state, what we'll find is that there's an exponential falloff in the number of photons that are emitted as a function of time. That is to say, this function here is just proportional to e to the minus tau for some time constant tau. You often hear tau talked about as the half-life of a decay process. Now, this probabilistic decay is interesting. It both tells us something about the stability of the energy state in question, but it's also telling us something about the shape of the line profile function. And the reason is that any function that has a profile in time can also be thought of in frequency space, just taking the, taking the Fourier transform of that. So if I take the Fourier transform of this exponential decay, I'm going to get a function of frequency that has some envelope. And the steeper this exponential decay versus time, that is the sharper the time feature associated with this decay, the broader Fourier transform of that function is. And similarly, if I have a very shallow decay profile here in Fourier space, that corresponds to a very narrow function. Now you'll sometimes hear this discussed as stemming from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But really all we're saying here is that any natural process that has some finite extent in time has to have an intrinsic width versus frequency. Now previously we've talked about an Einstein A coefficient that corresponds to a transition from an upper to a lower energy state and has units of inverse time, or one over seconds. And it's telling us something about the decay rate of an excited state versus time. So in other words, this tau, which relates to the half-life of an excited state needs to be related to an Einstein A of this transition times time. And hence, larger Einstein A's, which are in some sense stronger transitions, they decay more rapidly. Larger Einstein A's have correspondingly wider footprints in frequency. So just by the fact that we know that an Einstein A coefficient makes the time domain profile of our decay steeper, we know that in frequency domain, phi should probably be proportional to our Einstein A coefficient. And in fact, you can work out a general form for an exponential decay that's controlled by an Einstein A coefficient, and you get that phi, as a function of frequency, is equal to the Einstein A coefficient 
4 pi squared times 1 over the deviation of the observed frequency from the center frequency squared plus your Einstein A again over 4 pi squared. So this right here is an expression of the natural line width arising from the Einstein A, which is the spontaneous decay rate of this transition. And this profile is called a Lorentzian profile. And this natural line width, this Lorentzian profile, is saying something pretty interesting. It's saying that there's a direct relationship between the natural width of the line profile function and the Einstein A associated with this transition, which is saying something about the intrinsic strength of this transition. You remember Einstein A's also are related to the effective cross-section for interaction between a photon and an atom absorbing at this transition. So in some sense, the cross-section for interaction, the Einstein A coefficient, and the natural width of this line are all the same thing. They're a measure of how easy it is to excite or de-excite this transition. So that's natural line broadening. Now let's talk about the next item on our list, Doppler broadening. Doppler broadening is a little bit easier to understand. Let's say we have a few different atoms here that we're observing from a direction over here. Here's our eye looking at them. So all these atoms are emitting photons at us. However, let's suppose that some of these atoms are moving in different directions. This atom may be moving up this direction. This atom may be moving away from us. And this atom over here might be moving towards us. And as a result, the photons that they emit in their rest frame, even though they might be centered at nu zero, the, the center frequency of the natural line profile function, because they're moving in our rest frame, we observe these photons to be alternately blue shifted if the atoms are moving towards us, or red shifted if the atoms are moving away. And this means that even if the natural line profile function of this transition was very, very thin as a function of frequency. In fact, we could even pretend for now that it's a delta function at nu zero. The distribution of photons that we're going to get is actually just going to reflect the underlying distribution of velocities of these atoms, where some of them are moving towards us on this side and some are moving away. So in this case, this distribution is dominated by the velocity distribution. And hence, the frequency that we observe is a Doppler shifted version of the intrinsic nu zero frequency of the transition, where here this is v, the velocity of the atom we've chosen. Now if we're looking at a bunch of atoms here that are in thermal equilibrium at a well-defined temperature, we could estimate a typical RMS velocity, VRMS, given by setting the kinetic energy of one of these atoms, one half mv squared, equal to the thermal energy kT, where k is Boltzmann's constant. Hence our VRMS could be estimated as square root of 2 kT over the mass of the atom. So if we do this, we can come up with a, a Doppler width, which is the typical frequency shift associated with a atom moving with a typical velocity. And that's just going to be the center frequency divided by c times this typical velocity, 2 kT over the mass of the atom. Now if you want to, you can work out in detail using the fact that at a given temperature, the velocities of these atoms will be distributed. The distribution of atoms versus velocity will obey a Maxwellian distribution. And if you work that out, you'll come up with a line profile function that actually comes out to be a Gaussian, which is to say it's given by 1 over Doppler width times the square root of pi, this is just a normalization constant, times e to the minus mu minus nu zero squared over the characteristic Doppler width squared. So this is an expression for a Doppler broadened line profile function. And the key here is that it follows a Gaussian profile. Now an interesting thing to note here is that the more your temperature goes up, the wider the distribution of velocities you get. But because we have a fixed number of atoms, if we heat up this gas and increase the distribution, the number of atoms emitting near to the center frequency here actually goes down. So what this can mean is, if at some cooler temperature you're just barely getting to where you're optically thick, you have an optical depth of about one near the line center, if you heat up that gas, you'll actually find that the optical depth will go down near line center. So you may get away from being optical depth of unity and you'll become optically thin. 
Now that emission moves out to other higher frequencies, so you'll pick up that emission elsewhere. But it is important to remember that Doppler broadened lines get thinner. There are two other things I wanted to say about Doppler broadening. The first is that we've assumed that this whole box containing all of these atoms here is at rest relative to our observing frame. If there's a bulk flow, let's say this whole box is moving away from us, that doesn't widen the line that we're observing. It just shifts it in frequency. So if this whole box were moving away from us, this whole distribution would be moved lower in frequency. We would be redshifted. But this bulk flow isn't what we're interested in here. It's not something that's broadening this line. It's just shifting the, the overall frequency of it. So this Doppler broadening isn't talking about bulk flow. It's talking about the differential movement of atoms within this box. And the other thing I wanted to say about Doppler broadening is that anything that creates differential motion between these atoms can kind of look like Doppler broadening. And in astronomy, another common thing that can create this differential motion is turbulence. But because this is all the same underlying mechanism for widening a line, which is differential velocities between the atoms that are all emitting in their rest frame at some characteristic frequency, turbulence can very easily be incorporated into the velocities for Doppler broadening. So we can talk not just about the, the thermal width, which is what we did here using a temperature to derive our, our characteristic velocity spread, but we can also use turbulence there as well. So that's Doppler broadening. Now before I go off and talk about collisional broadening, there's one thing I wanted to mention here, which is that it's very common to need to take into account both a Lorentzian profile, which arises from the natural line width of our transition, along with this Doppler broadening that arises from the fact that this gas may just be at a temperature. So there's a Lorentzian profile, which is kind of the natural line profile, and then there's the thermal Doppler broadening. And these together, because they come in tandem so often, is called a Voigt profile. And a Voigt profile is just the convolution of the natural line width with the Doppler broadened line width. So it's the convolution of a Lorentzian and a Gaussian profile. And the reason why we have to keep both around is because it's never really the case that one of these distributions just completely dominates over the other. This is because Doppler broadening, this Gaussian profile, has this exponential fall off, but it's quite flat as we get in close to the center frequency of our transition. On the other hand, this Lorentzian profile here has a characteristic frequency squared fall off, which makes it rather sharply peaked toward the center frequency, but with these long wings. So our Lorentzian profile falls off and has these long wings, while our thermal profile tends to be broader in the center, but then to drop off more rapidly. So this Voigt profile takes into account the fact that you're dominated by thermal Doppler broadening near the center here, but you're dominated by the Lorentzian wings farther away from the center frequency. All right, now we can finally get to the last of the mechanisms for broadening a spectral line, which is collisional broadening. So as you might imagine, the idea with collisional broadening is you now have a bunch of atoms here, and typically they need to be pretty densely packed so that they can collide pretty frequently. And the idea is that these collisions interfere with the natural emission process that you might have. So if you remember our earlier plot versus time, and we were counting the number of photons that were emitted, there was a natural decay process just from spontaneous decay. But collisions can interfere with this process. We're used to talking about collisions as exciting electronic transitions, which can then emit photons. And we even talked about collisional de-excitation, where these atoms will collide with one another and, and rob away some of the electronic energy as kinetic energy. But another thing that these collisions can do, if an atom is in an excited state, is help it to emit the photon. And so what we'll observe is, relative to the spontaneous decay rate that we would measure, if we allow these atoms to collide with one another, we'll see that they actually decay faster, which is to say they'll emit more of their photons early on in the decay process, and there will be fewer photons that come out later. So these collisions make the characteristic decay curve steeper in time. 
And you know what that means for the frequency profile, the Fourier transform of this, means that instead of follow, following a typical Lorentzian profile here, something that's steeper in time is going to give us a function in frequency space which is wider. So collisional broadening is taking into account the fact that when collision time scales are comparable to decay time scales, we can get an artificially broadened line profile function. So to be clear here, this is talking about when the time scale for a collision is of order the time scale for spontaneous decay, which is about 1 over the Einstein A. Now we've discussed in previous lectures the collision rate for a given particle that we're looking at to collide with some other particle out there is given by the number density of these particles, these atoms, times their cross-section for collision times the relative velocity with which these atoms are moving with respect to one another. And for this collision rate to substantially impact our line profile function, this collision rate, which is the inverse of the collision time, will need to be of order the Einstein A coefficient. So one thing to notice is that for collisional broadening to be important, we need to have a dense gas moving at relatively high velocity, so possibly a high temperature. And these two factors together are related to pressure. So, the, so collisional broadening is sometimes also called pressure broadening. And the other thing, of course, is that the collisional cross-section also helps determine whether collisional broadening is important. For a fixed density of atoms and a fixed velocity, the time scale for interaction is inversely proportional to the cross-section. And the reason we care about this is for atoms, there are a variety of different ways that they can interact, which have different cross-sections for interaction. For example, if we have ions or charged particles, we can have Coulomb collisions, which are based on an E-field that falls as 1 over R squared. But if we have neutral atoms, where we start having to talk about a dipole field, that'll fall off as 1 over R cubed. And similarly, we could go to quadrupole fields and so on. And because these different fields fall off at different rates, we can have collisional cross-sections that are substantially different for different interactions. So these are the main three sources of broadening for spectral lines. There's the intrinsic width of the line, which just relates to the strength of that transition, or the Einstein A. There is Doppler broadening, which relates to the differential motion of atoms in a cloud, such that some of the photons that are emitted or absorbed are red-shifted or blue-shifted relative to the center frequency, and that broadens the line. And finally, for high densities and high temperatures, we have collisional broadening, which can dominate when collisions happen on timescales comparable to the spontaneous decay rate. And for a fixed density and temperature, the cross-section for collisions dictates a time scale for interaction. And different interaction mechanisms dictate different cross-sectional areas. Therefore, the time scales for collisional broadening depend on which type of interaction dominates. And this has an effect on the shape of a collisionally broadened line profile function. And of course, all of these mechanisms for broadening can affect any given spectral line that we're observing at. And all of these mechanisms add width to a spectral line by convolving one another. So a Voigt profile is the convolution of a Lorentzian profile, which is the natural line width, and a Gaussian profile relating to the temperature of the gas. And similarly, if collisional broadening is an important term, the collisional broadening will convolve the Voigt profile and add extra width to the line profile function. And in general, we need to include all of these different effects where appropriate because at different distances from line center, different profiles can dominate the overall line profile function. For example, as we saw in the Voigt profile, Doppler broadening or thermal broadening dominates near to line center, whereas the Lorentzian wings, the natural width of the line profile function, can dominate farther from line center. And that's our discussion of line profile functions, which dictate the shape of spectral line emission as a function of frequency.